Hi, this is Bart Polson, and this is a video for Psychology 1100 Lifespan Development. And in this uh, section, we're going to be looking at Chapter 6 of our text on adolescence and Section 3 on social and emotional development during adolescence. The first thing we want to look at is the development of identity, which according to theorist Eric Erickson was the major task during adolescence. In fact, the idea here is that adolescents are preoccupied not only with their present selves, who they are right now, but also with what they want to become, uh, that, where they hope to negotiate a place in the future. And so Eric Erickson, in his uh, psychosocial theory of development, said the primary task for adolescents is to develop a firm sense of who they are and what they stand for. He referred to that as ego identity. On the other hand, he said uh, adolescents who fail to acquire this sense often become subject to the whims of others. He referred to that as role diffusion. Uh, on the other hand, another researcher, James Marcia, uh, took that idea and expanded on it, developing what he called identity statuses. Um, and these are based on a combination of whether a person ex engaged in identity exploration and whether they made a commitment to a particular identity. And from that, you get four possibilities. Starting at the bottom left, identity diffusion means that a person has not engaged in any exploration, hasn't tried to figure things out, and they also haven't made any commitment. You know, so they're kind of uh, freeform floating around. It says they might be carefree, they might also be unhappy and rebellious, um, but they have not made any uh, commitment at all. Um, on the other hand, to the left of that, you have moratorium. And what that is, is that's people who are in the process of exploring. So they're engaged in the exploration. They have not yet made a commitment or they're exploring it over again. And this is where they're very sensitive to these issues, trying to figure out exactly where they fit on those for themselves, how they fit into society. And it can lead to some pretty serious anxiety and ambivalence towards people with whom they may find that they disagree. On the top right, we have foreclosure. And this is people who have not explored identities. They haven't tried to figure out what they personally believe in, but they have made a commitment. Uh, and the idea here is that you're simply doing what somebody else either told you to do or you were just raised expecting it. And what you find is that the people who do this, again, often authoritarian, say we do this because we do this and can be very inflexible. So that, that's a problem. Uh, the top left one is what uh, Marcia referred to as identity achievement. So this is when people have engaged in an active exploration of their identity and they have settled upon a conclusion and made a commitment. So it, it's the most developed identity because they've engaged in the entire process. Um, they have a, per, uh, what is a per sense of personal well-being, high self-esteem, self-acceptance, also more cognitively flexible than people who simply accepted an identity that somebody else put on them. Um, so it's a much more involved kind of identity. Also, adolescents tend to shift from uh, to either the moratorium and achievement statuses during the high school and college years. So identity development, uh, it relates to relationships and occupational choices, among other matters. An extended part of uh, identity development has to do with self-esteem. So children also tend to describe Younger children tend to describe themselves mainly in terms of their physical characteristics and their actions, their, you know, the things they do. On the other hand, near adolescents, children begin to add in psychological characteristics and social relationships to their uh, self-description. So things that become more abstract. Self-perceptions also become more complex in adolescents as a, uh, compared to those of younger children. And also, self-esteem tends to decline from middle childhood to the age of 12 or 13, because young adolescents are becoming more self-conscious. Which brings up the issue of relationships with parents and peers. Um, and adolescents are greatly influenced by both their parents and their peers, but the, the degree of influence shifts. Most teenagers tend to spend less time with their parents than they did in childhood. Um, they're developing a sense of independence. They also clash with their mothers more often than with their fathers, but also are more likely to view their mothers as being more supportive. So it's paradoxical that way. Um, on the other hand, adolescents who have a poor relationship with their fathers, we have a, it looks like a bossy father right here. Uh, adolescents with a poor relationship with their fathers are more often depressed. In fact, uh, that's a better predictor, the poor relationship with the father of adolescent depression than conflict with siblings or mothers or whether they have an overbearing mother or a lot of other uh, social uh, factors. Similarly, a good relationship uh, with the fathers enhances an adolescent psychological well-being. Also, parents during this time tend to loosen up and use punishment less as teenagers grow older for a number of reasons. 
And also, parenting styles have an influence on the development of teens. Those uh, adolescents who grow up in an authoritative home, that's one that's very high in warmth uh, and very high in c communication, where they, ex they have high uh, expectations, they make demands, but there is also communication and support in the process. Those kids who grow up in that one tend to demonstrate the healthiest behaviors in the teenage years. Also, throughout ad adolescence, uh, same-gender friendships grow more important, and by 10th grade, uh, same-gender friendships be uh, surpass in importance uh, to the adolescents. They become more important than the support of their parents. Uh, friendships are also very important to teenagers, often have one or two best friends, a few good friends. And friendship in adolescence differs from friendship in childhood. So, for instance, teens stress acceptance and openness and mutual understanding with their companions. They also usually have friends of the same gender and race. They're often similar in their attitudes, their grades, and their educational goals. Um, you know, which really brings uh, to mind the research saying that, you know, really it is birds of a feather flock together. People are attracted to people who share their worldview and who validate the same thing. Uh, in that same vein, most adolescents belong to one or more peer groups. These can include crowds, it can include formal organizations like sports or just uh, cliques at school. Uh, a clique, five to ten people who share their time together. Uh, and crowd, just a larger group that may or may not spend time together, often made up of both sexes, um, recognized by activities and attitudes. Also, dating starts during early and middle adolescence, and most teens start to date by the time they graduate from high school. Uh, now, peer pressure is not as strong in early adolescent, early adolescence, but it peaks during mid-adolescence, then starts to decrease after the age of about 17. Okay, now about sexuality. Um, because of this, really, this onset, the rush, the flood of sex hormones, adolescents tend to experience powerful sex drive. In addition, media exposes teenagers to themes that are often sexually oriented. I think we're all familiar with that. Now, most adolescents are heterosexual, um, that is, sexually attracted to, want to establish romantic relationships with people of the opposite sex. On the other hand, um, a significant number have uh, a homosexual identity or a bisexual identity, so they may be attracted to and look to build relationships with members of their own gender. Now, being gay or lesbian in a very heterosexual society can be stressful, can cause a lot of anxiety about social acceptance. Um, in fact, it usually takes gay or lesbian adolescents 10 years to come out after their first same-sex attraction. So there's this very long ambivalent period. Um, that first attraction, according to research by Rich Savin Williams and Lisa Diamond, who's just up the road in the psychology department at the University of Utah, that first recognition of same-sex attraction usually takes around takes place around the age of nine and so not till 19 18 or 19 do uh actually come out and uh, sort of recognize themselves socially as gay or lesbian also in terms of sexual behavior there's masturbation that sexual self-stimulation is most it's the most common sexual outlet in adolescence and most teenage males masturbate but it's less common among adolescent females it still occurs just less common also while some believe that masturbation is damaging and shameful, you know, the, the, the theories that it'll make you go blind or something like that, research has not shown it to be physically harmful um, or damaging in other ways. On the other hand, we can talk about sexual behavior here, and we can talk about the number of adolescents who are sexually active. And what you see here is uh, there are racial and ethnic differences, and they've also... Uh, interestingly, gone down a little bit over time. A little bit. Adolescents start dating earlier now than in previous generations, so teens that begin dating earlier are more likely to become sexually active during high school. So petting or you know kissing and touching the breasts and genitals is common practice among American teenagers. And the hormonal changes of puberty are partially responsible for starting sexual activity. Now, adolescents learn about sex from peers of the same gender and from the media, um, rather than about parent or sex education class. So that lets you uh, see where may perhaps relative emphasis ought to be placed in issues of sex education, which of course are very charged social and political issue. Uh, one significant issue is teenage pregnancy. Um, not surprisingly, most teenage pregnancies are uh, accidental and the there is a lack of committed partners. So it's usually gonna be a, um, a single mom. Um, 
every year in the U.S., there's somewhere between 750,000 to 800,000 teenage girls who become pregnant. Now, I'm assuming we're talking about unmarried teenage girls because we're in Utah and there's a lot who are married. Um, these rates are actually lower than they were 10 to 20 years ago, uh, which is nice. And it's, it's been attributed to a better use of contraception and sex education. Um, this is significant because, not surprisingly, adolescents who are pregnant and give birth can face a lot of challenges. So you can have a lack of prenatal medical care. You can have uh, the typical adolescent poor eating habits. Um, and there, there can be serious complications for the mother and the baby. Um, sex education programs in schools can help teenagers learn safe sex practices. That's a very charged topic here in Utah. And despite fears that sexual education will increase sexual activity in teens, you know, a number of programs have shown that they've been able to delay it, uh, delay the beginning of sexual activity in teenagers. Again, you see also that there's been a decrease in sexual activity and a decrease in the rate of pregnancy among teenagers. Speaking of problematic behaviors, we can look at juvenile delinquency. And what we see, children or adolescents uh, who engage in illegal activities or come into contact with the criminal justice system, you know, that's what we mean by juvenile delinquents. So criminal and antisocial behavior increases in adolescents, then it decreases in adulthood, you know. Um, and what you see here is also there's been some important changes over time with um, each of these groups sort of rising during the 90s and um, uh, in terms of juvenile delinquency, but going down over time. Um, so in the 2000s, uh, the rate becomes lower. About four out of 10 serious crimes in the U.S. are committed by a person under the age of 21. Um, the age of adulthood is different in the juvenile justice system. And while young men are generally more likely to commit crimes than young women, uh, there are some interesting exceptions. So for instance, truancy. Uh, which actually is a crime, is committed more often uh, by teenage girls than by teenage boys. Um, teenagers under 18 account for 3 out of 10 serious crimes in the U.S., and many delinquent acts don't lead to arrest or conviction. Um, if the adolescents are arrested, their cases may be uh, disposed of informally, or they may be referred to a mental health agency. Um, I, I'm just going to throw in something that's not in the textbook, but research uh, here in Utah has shown that uh, Kids who get who have contact with the juvenile justice system are um, twice as likely to commit suicide. Um, it's it's the single best predictor from public records of suicide risk. Also, children who show aggressive antisocial hyperactive behavior at an early age are more likely to show delinquent behavior in adolescence. Also, delinquency is associated with low verbal IQ, low self-esteem, immature moral reasoning, impulsivity. And other risks for criminal behavior are early substance abuse, poor grades, sexual activity, young age, along with having delinquent friends, not surprisingly. And uh, speaking of suicide, that'll be the last thing we look at right here. Um, adolescence can be an exciting time of life for many young people, but for some, it's really it's too difficult and end up taking their own lives. Suicide, in fact, is the third leading cause of death among teenagers, with about uh, one to two in every 10,000 American adolescents killing themselves every year, and with one in an attempt engaging in suicidal behaviors. So the rates also differ between racial and ethnic groups, um, with substantially higher rates in the U.S. for Native American adolescents. Now, most suicides among teenagers and adults linked to feelings of depression, hopelessness, and linked to stressful life events. Now, some, some of the warning signs for suicide in teenagers can include things like substance abuse, uh, delinquency, a belief that it's okay to kill yourself, uh, victimization by bullying. Um, interestingly, um, excessive body piercings and heavy smoking are also predictors of uh, suicide risk. Now, there's a big gender difference here in that teenage girls are, are more likely nationally. They're three times more likely in Utah. They're nine times more likely uh, than teenage uh, boys to um, engage in suicidal behavior. So you can call it a suicidal attempt. Um, on the other hand, it's usually by taking drugs and it's usually not enough to kill themselves. And most of the time when this happens, there other people intervene and the person does not die. And so you can call it really a parasuicidal behavior. Um, teenage males, on the other hand, are more likely to actually complete the suicide. You can call it succeeding, but they complete the suicide, they actually die, uh, largely because they choose speedy and deadly methods. Basically, they're more, much more likely to shoot themselves. Um, and so there is also, 
the issue here of um, suicide prevention. Again, this part's not in the book, but a lot, a big problem is that the people who are more likely to actually kill themselves are, are much less likely to call suicide hotlines. Um, so basically, it's it's guys who have guns. They generally don't call. There's no warning. It happens. And suicide prevention hotlines um, are, are obviously less likely to be effective in that case. On the other hand, with people who engage in parasuicidal behavior, such as uh, women who take uh, medication, are more likely to call a suicidal hotline, which is more likely to get an intervention. Um, and so while they may not have actually died as a process of it, the, the suicidal behavior creates an enormous amount of stress for themselves, for their families, and so the interventions can be very helpful in that method. And that's where we're going to stop this particular section.